Good morning, class. This is Mr. Butler. The purpose of this video is to guide you through a reading of Chapter 2 of Of Mice and Men by John Steinbeck. By this point, you should have already read Chapter 1 and answered the questions and completed the TPS activity, and many of you have. I realize that reading an entire chapter by yourself could be daunting, and so I'm here to read the chapter out loud and also provide a live analysis, uh, a think aloud, of what the author is doing and how he's employing literary techniques and figurative language for certain effects throughout the chapter. You will notice that there are nine questions, which I would like you to answer with a claim, evidence, reasoning structure, which means that you should be using direct quotations from the text. Throughout the reading, while I won't be referring directly to the questions, I will be covering the aspects of the text which will help you answer them. This video may be a bit longer than some of my other videos, and I would encourage you to pause throughout the video to go and answer relevant questions um, at your pace. If you want to watch the video in segments uh, uh, and break it up uh, into different sittings, so to speak, that also might be a good strategy. Um, so uh, a quick summary of chapter one, we're introduced to George and Lenny. Uh, the chapter is primarily about the characterization uh, of those two individuals and their relationship. We see clearly that George is in charge and at first he seems like he kind of bosses around Lenny, but as the chapter continues, it's clear that George uh, is, you know, um, loyal to Lenny and Lenny is loyal to George and that they rely on each other's friendship and companionship. Um, they are migrant workers, which means that they're essentially homeless. They don't have a home. They move around from ranch to ranch and farm to farm and provide whatever, whatever kind of labor um, they can to make enough money to survive for a while until that job is done and then they move on to the next one. Um, in fact, their shared fantasy, their shared desire... Uh, their central motivation as characters is for George and Lenny eventually to get enough money, to save up enough money to um, buy their own farm and to have their own place where they can belong and protect that friendship. Um, and that's the, the main motivating force that are driving these characters uh, throughout the text. So let's start with chapter two. And uh, like I said, feel free to pause the video at any time to go back and answer those questions. The bunkhouse was a long, rectangular building. Inside, the walls were whitewashed and the floor unpainted. Here we have the author launching into a detailed visual description using imagery to show us what uh, the bunkhouse looks like uh, on the interior. And the bunkhouse would just be essentially a large room with bunks, with beds, for the workers to, to sleep in and to stay collectively. Um, and different workers would come through and stay in, in the bunkhouse while they were on that one particular job before they move on to the next one. In three walls, there were small square windows, and in the fourth, a solid door with a wooden latch. Against the walls were eight bunks, five of them made up with blankets and the other three showing their burlap ticking. Over each bunk, there was nailed an apple box with the opening forward so that it made two shelves for the personal belongings of the occupant of the bunk. And these shelves were loaded with little articles, soap and talcum pow powder, razors, and those Western magazines ranch men love to read and scoff at and se secretly believe. So here we're very heavy with description. Um, this is a good time for me to point out that Steinbeck originally intended for Of Mice and Men to be a stage play, not actually a novel. So, you know, one thing that you'll notice in my copy here, there's no chapter uh number is just blank at the top. Your PDF copy has a little mouse, um, but no chapter number. And that's why I'm posting chapters and segments. Uh, so a play would start with stage directions or a description of the set. And that's what's going on here. So Steinbeck kind of retains that descriptive language at the beginning of a chapter. And it's normal to describe a setting at the beginning of a chapter, um, but not typically in, in this level of detail. And there were medicines on the shelves, and little vials, combs, and from nails on the box sides, a few neckties. Near one wall, there was a black cast-iron stove, 
its stovepipe going straight up through the ceiling. In the middle of the room stood a big square table littered with playing cards, and around it were grouped boxes for the players to sit on. At about 10 o'clock in the morning, the sun threw a bright dust-laden bar through one of the side windows, and in and out of the beam flies shot like rushing stars. There we have a simile that helps add a richness to the image of the flies shooting through the beam of light coming through the window, which uh, you should be actively trying to imagine in your mind. You know, it's kind of dusty in there. It might be a little musty, right? There's signs of activity, playing cards, um, objects that the men are using to, uh, for themselves and for others. The wooden latch raised. The door opened and a tall, stoop-shouldered old man came in. He was dressed in blue jeans, and he carried a big push broom in his left hand. Behind him came George, and behind George, Lenny. It's significant that Lenny is following George. So that is symbolic of their relationship. Also, I'd point out here that we're describing characters, which is an element of characterization through appearance. Remember the four modes of characterization. Appearance, speech, actions, thoughts, and I suppose... You could also include what other characters uh, say about each other. The boss was expecting you last night, the old man said. He was sore as hell when you wasn't here to go out this morning. He pointed with his right arm, and out of the sleeve came a round stick-like wrist, but no hand. You can have them two beds there, he said, indicating two bunks near the stove. So I apologize if my pronunciation of the dialect is perhaps not um, as refined as a professional actor. One thing you'll notice when you're reading the text is that the author intentionally misspells words that are part of the dialogue. Remember that dialogue is when characters are speaking to each other and it's indicated by quotation marks. You're going to notice the use of punctuation in the form of apostrophes to leave out S's, N's, and G's, and things like that to give that southern twang and to imply an accent that the characters would be um, speaking with. Here we see that the boss is upset that George and Lenny are late. George stepped over and threw his blankets down on the burlap sack of straw that was a mattress. He looked into his box shelf and then picked a small yellow can from it. Say, what the hell's this? I don't know, said the old man. Says, positively kills lice, roaches, and other scourges. What the hell kind of bed you given us anyways? We don't want no pants rabbits. So, uh, pants rabbits clearly being some kind of pest, maybe bed bugs, right? So George is picking up this can that another rancher has left and he says, are there roach, are there bed bugs in this bed? Why are you giving this bed to me? The old swamper, swamper, uh, meaning someone who would like sweep up and, and clean, um, the, the bunk house and, and other buildings on the ranch. The old swamper swift shifted his broom and held it between his elbow and his side, where he held out his hand for the can. He studied the label carefully. Tell you what, he said finally. Last guy that had this bed was a blacksmith. Hell of a nice fella, and as clean a guy as you want to meet. Used to wash his hands even after he ate. Um, which, yes, hand washing. Good, very good. Wash your hands all the time, especially now. Then how come he got graybacks? Grayback, I can Im infer, uh, would be like pants rabbits, some uh, word for some kind of pest or some kind of insect that might uh, live in the bunk and be harmful. George was working up a slow anger. Lenny put his bindle on the neighboring bunk and sat down. He watched George with open mouth. Tell you what, said the old swamper, this here blacksmith name of Whitey was the kind of guy that would put out the stuff around even if there wasn't no bugs, just to make sure, see? Tell you what he used to do. At meals, he'd peel his boiled potatoes and he'd take out every little spot, no matter what kind, before he'd eat it. And if there was a red splotch on an egg, he'd scrape it off. Finally quit about the food. That's the kind of guy he was. Clean. Used to dress up Sundays even when he wasn't going no place, but put on a necktie even, and then set in the bunkhouse. I ain't so sure, said Je George skeptically. What did you say he quit for? The old man put the yellow can in his pocket, and he rubbed his bristly white whiskers with his knuckles. Why, he just quit, the way a guy will. 
Says it was the food. Just wanted to move. Didn't give no other reason but the food. Just says, give me my time one night. The guy, uh, the way any guy would. George lifted his tick and looked underneath it, lifted his mattress. He leaned over the inspect and, and inspected the sacking closely. Immediately, Lenny got up and did the same with his bed. Notice how Lenny's imitating uh, George the way a child might imitate a parent. Finally, George seemed satisfied. He unrolled his bindle and put things on the shelf, his razor, his bar of soap, his comb and bottle of pills, his liniment and leather wristband. Then he made his bed up neatly with blankets. The old man said, I guess the boss will be here in a minute. He was sure burned when you wasn't here in the morning. Come right in when we was eating breakfast and says, where the hell's them two new men? And he give the stable buck hell too. George patted a wrinkle out of the bed and sat down. Give the stable buck hell, he asked. Sure. You see the stable bucks. So one thing you're going to notice about this book is uh, it makes use of the N-word. So that would have been, um, unfortunately, normal for the time, not as taboo or prohibitive for the time to be included in literature. I, it, uh, it would make me uncomfortable to use that word um, in, in any context, in a classroom context or, or on a video. So I'm not going to use it, okay? Um, and it's important to point out that texts that are basically a primary source document um, that are of a historical context often include language or um, content which we would find unacceptable, racist, by today's standards. And while it's important to with uh, uphold those standards, um, we, we must not make the mistake of imposing them inappropriately on on works of the past works that come out of history so i'm not going to use it um as i read the text um but uh just know that um it would have been accurate of the time yeah nice fellow too got a crooked back where a horse kicked him the boss gives him hell when he's mad but the stable buck don't give a damn about that he reads a lot. Got books in his room. What kind of guy is the boss? George asked. Well, he's a pretty nice fella. Gets pretty mad sometimes, but he's pretty nice. Tell you what. Know what he done Christmas? Bring a gallon of whiskey right in here and says, Drink hearty, boys. Christmas comes once a year. What the hell he did? A whole gallon? Yes, sir. Jesus, we had fun. They let the stable buck come in that night. Little Skinner name of Smitty took after him. Done pretty good, too. The guys wouldn't let him use his feet, so the stable buck got him. If he couldn't use his feet, Smitty says he would have killed him. The guy said on account of the stable buck's got a crooked back. Smitty can't use his feet. He paused in relish of the memory. After that, the guys went into Soldad and raised hell. I didn't go in there. I ain't got the poop no more. Lenny was just finishing making his bed. The wooden latch raised again and the door opened. A little stocky man stood in the open doorway. He wore blue jean trousers, a flannel shirt, a black unbuttoned vest, and a black coat. His thumbs were stuck in his belt on each side of a square steel buckle. On his head was a soiled brown Stetson hat. That's a big cowboy hat. And here we're characterizing a new character who's entered uh, based on his appearance. And he wore high-heeled boots and spurs to prove he was not a laboring man. So this guy is kind of dressed nicer than the workers, all right? This guy is not one of the workers. The old swamper looked quickly at him and then shuffled out the door, rubbing his whiskers with his knuckles as he went. Them guys just come, he says, and shuffles past the boss and out the door. The boss stepped into the room with the short, quick steps of a fat-legged man. I wrote Murray and Reddy. I wanted two men this morning. You got your work slips. So Murray and Reddy, capitalized in the text, is a reference to the company that would have helped George and Lenny basically post a, um, you know, an ad for hire so that the uh, ranch boss can sort of look in a catalog or, or, or a magazine and say, okay, I'm going to hire these two available workers. That would be Murray and Reddy. And he's asking them for their credentials, their work slips. George reached into his pocket and produced the slips and handed them to the boss. 
It wasn't Murray and Rennie's fault. It says right here on the slip that you were to be here for work this morning. So the boss is upset that they're late, that they're not on time. George looked down at his feet. Bus driver gave us a bum steer, he said. We had to walk 10 miles. Says we was here when we wasn't. We couldn't get no rides in the morning. So the bus driver kicks him off the bus, says, oh yeah, it's just a stretch down the road. It ends up being 10 miles and they, they don't uh, make it to the ranch on time. A legitimate excuse. The boss squir squinted his eyes. Well, I had to send out the grain team's two buckers short. Won't do any good to go out now till after dinner. He pulled his time book out of his pocket and opened it where a pencil was stuck between the leaves. George scowled meaningfully at Lenny, and Lenny nodded to show that he understood. The boss licked his pencil. What's your name? So if you remember, in chapter one, George was very adamant about Lenny not saying anything. It's not explicitly stated, but it's clear that Lenny suffers from an intellectual disability, and George is taking care of him, uh, even though Lenny is... Um, you know, later we're going to find out that he's going to be the best worker. He's very strong and capable, uh, despite his intellectual shortcomings.